Good morning. Welcome to worship. Bobby stand as you're able. We're going to lift our voice and sing along. You can see we're organized this morning, aren't we? Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was It was my too Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day let's sing it out now your mercy now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you When you called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day when you call my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day this is our prayer this morning I needed rescue, my sins were heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Amen. Well, we are so thankful that everyone is able to join us for worship today. This week, as I've been studying and preparing for this week's message, Scripture has really hit me in a different place again, uh, really challenging me on some things that I thought I understood, and God keeps pushing. So I wanted to share from Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. It says, Indeed, the Word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare in the eyes of the one with whom we must all give account. 
What an incredible God we serve that knows us so intimately. And what an incredible gift we get to study Scripture together as the body of Christ. You may have a seat. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us today. As we're uh, getting started here, we have a few quick announcements. The first is, uh, if you're a guest with us, joining us online or here today, and you want to connect, um, or whether you're a guest or not, uh, we have this number, 308-730-4040. That helps us connect with first-time guests and all of our membership. So um, that's a great resource. There's also a connect card in the back. That's great for prayer requests, for sharing comments, or, or whatever else is going on in your life. And I know that um, that seems a little tedious, but go on ahead and save that to your phone. If you want to pull that out and just save that as well to your phone, um, just this week, someone was texting us because of a, of a loved one in the hospital, and, and it was great to be able to have that update and to share that in real time, and that allows us as a staff to be able to care for you and meet you uh, and your needs better too. So anyway, thank you for sharing that. Again, with your prayer requests, uh, share those anytime. Uh, our first announcement has to do with uh, this afternoon. We're going to be doing a trash walk at Dodge Hill. It's just as easy as showing up. I do invite you. It's still kind of springtime. It may seem too early for this, but um, I hear ticks and things are already out. So go on ahead and plan to wear long jeans or, or whatever and, and boots if you have them. Um, but past that, just come out and uh, help us out. Uh, you know, it, it serves the community, and it's part of our, our missions committee commitment as well. So uh, help our missions committee. You can just show up at 4 p.m. If you are a minor, they have a little release you sign, but they have those on site. So just plan to, to do that. And the more that show up, the merrier. So, uh, and the quicker we get done as well. So if you, if you have a chance, enjoy some fresh sunshine this afternoon. Um, this week, well, next Sunday, we have our Memorial Day weekend uh, tradition that we practice here at First Church anyway. We honor the lives of those who have gone before us over the last, um, basically, calendar year. And it's a really neat time. It's actually, uh, it sounds a little downer, actually, when you talk about it, but honestly, taking time to go back and re-examine our life, re-examine um, kind of where we're at in a stage of grief is a really healthy thing for us to do. And so we're going to do that in a couple of ways. At all three services, we're going to share a video, a little tribute video of those who have gone before us. And then at 1030 worship, we're going to have a little kind of candlelight vigil kind of thing and reading them names. And so just wanted to invite you to that and, and, and just encourage you. And maybe if you know somebody who is is questioning their grief or struggling with their grief or anything like that, to go on ahead and maybe just, this is a great weekend to, to talk about that and to maybe experience some healing. It's a really good, really good worship coming up this week. Great worship today. Uh, last thing I'm going to mention is Vacation Bible School. Registration is open. That's starting July 9th, but we want to get as many kids pre-registered as possible. I saw some other churches are doing this theme. Um, make sure to be clear. When it, whenever they register, go to First Church. Uh, that's, the one that, that's the one they want, firstchurchnp.com. I, I love a lot of what the other churches do, but I, I really believe this is one of the best vacation Bible schools in the state. And so uh, be sure to get the kids registered, and if you encounter them, it's free. All they got to do is just register online, and that helps us out. So anyway, lots going on this summer, lots going on in the church. We're here to worship. I'll invite you to stand. We got another fun one to continue in. Got him on my knees again. Got him begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down this desert road, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Sing about his forgiveness. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. On my skin. Oh, dead men. Dead men walking walk slaves to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, I need you. So take, 
So take me to the riverside, take me on to baptize, I need you, oh God, I need you, oh, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Sing, I don't want to. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to Sing it again. No, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever makes me One more time. I don't. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever Makes me want to change your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ear. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water. Let's sing. Here we go. Glory, glory. I've been singing since I laid my burden down. Glory, glory. I've been singing since I laid my burden down. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah, God is faithful, hallelujah, Lord, I'm going to sing. I feel better, oh, so much better, since I laid, since I laid my burden down. I feel better, so much, much better, better, since I lay, oh Lord, I lay my, my burden down. down. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah, God is faithful, hallelujah, Lord, I'm, I'm going to sing. sing. One more time. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah. God is faithful, hallelujah, Lord, I'm going to sing. As long as I'm alive, there's going to be praise. As long as I'm alive, there's going to be shouting. One thing, the one thing that I know, oh, deep down in my soul, oh, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to sing. What you going to sing? I'm singing hallelujah. God is able. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm going to sing. One more time. I'm singing hallelujah. God is able. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm going to sing. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward for a children's moment. Morning. <clears throat> Ooh, 
Okay, so do you know where I'm from, where I was born? Okay, yeah, so I was born in Mexico. And I'm going to tell you a little story that happened a long, long, long time ago in Mexico. Okay, the people from Mexico, the people that were there before the, the Spaniards came, they were called Aztecs, okay? So when the Spaniards came to the New World, they noticed that the Aztecs had a lot of gold and silver and gems, and they were very rich. But the Spaniards had something the Aztecs had never seen before, and they didn't have it. So when they saw it, they thought it was the coolest thing ever, and they really wanted it. And it's something that we all have at home, that we all have a lot of it. Well, not a lot of it. Oh, well, maybe if you're like me, you probably have several around your house. Can you guess what it is? I have one right here inside this little box. Any guesses? It can be really small. It can be very big. Well, since the Aztecs had never seen that, they re it was something very common. They really, really liked it. They decided to give the... Spaniards, their gold, their money, their jewels in exchange for this one thing. No guesses? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. What is it? A mirror. Yeah. They had never seen a mirror before. So when they saw one, they thought it was the coolest thing. They thought it was so cool, and they were so fascinated by it that they gave up their gold, their jewels. They gave a lot of things just so the Spaniards would give them mirrors. And if you look at them, they're kind of cool. I like them. I like looking at myself, so that's probably why I like them. So, but... You can see yourself, right? Your reflection. Well, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be like mirrors. We're supposed to be a reflection. Do you know who you're supposed to reflect? Yourself? We're supposed to reflect Jesus. So when people look at us, they can see how Jesus would be, how Jesus would act, how Jesus would love, how he would treat others. So we are called to be a reflection of Jesus. And that's not always very easy, right? Sometimes we don't act like Jesus. Sometimes we get mad and we're impatient and we're grumpy. So let's go ahead and ask God today to help us to be more like him and to reflect him to others, okay? Dear Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these children. I ask you to help all of us in this room to be more like you, to reflect your love, your kindness towards everyone around us, that they get to know you through us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we like to give each other a little bit of grief. So here's, here's what it looks like live. Do you know why the Aztecs were there? Because that's because you were there at the same time, Denise? No? Yeah? Because, no? I like, to, I like to tease that one because I'm the youngest on staff, so I can, I can make all the old jokes for now anyway. But I tease. I, I, that's a bad dad joke. We, we give each other a lot of grief here at the church, and Pastor Mike was giving me a little grief last night uh, because it, I made it sound like in one of the announcements maybe that I was excited for the next message series that we're going to start next week. Um, as if this message series I didn't like as much. And, and actually, I've been very fond of this message series. I am fond of next message series because I, I helped do a little more of the planning on it. Um, it's a series called Bad Advice. So a little shameless plug there. The worship leader planned a whole bunch of bad advice for June, okay? So uh, whatever, I, I guess we'll see how that works. He can, he, that's, that's another bad dad joke. Anyway. Um, I, I have really enjoyed this series and uh, the impact that it's made on me and, and several in, folks in the church. And, and one of the things I, I wanted to share with you today as we move into a time to where we see God at work in our lives is oftentimes you all reply to an email or share a word of encouragement 
that just comes to us as a staff. And anyway, it, I think it's something that the whole church might benefit from and, and just enjoy. And this, this is just proof that you don't have to be on staff or a certain age or a certain level in order to encourage one another. We can, we can do that at all stages, and I really love that, and I want to celebrate that. So this isn't, these aren't my words. These aren't necessarily even theirs, but this is something that they shared that was meaningful and I think pertains to our all-in kind of concept as we're wrapping it up this week. So here's the story. Here's the email. It, it's, it, it starts kind of funny. I grabbed my keys and slammed the door as hard as I could. I got in the car and headed out of the neighborhood. I may or may not have screamed some choice obscenities as loud as I could, hoping it might exercise, get out the anger that was overflowing within me. What drove me into this state of rage, maybe you can relate, just the realization that I had forgotten to buy one of the main ingredients for dinner that evening. A small thing in the grand scheme of things, and, and as normally, I'm, I'm mild-mannered as they come, but... This was the tipping point in a long line of assaults and frustrations for the week. I had had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad week, and the missing box of jambalaya rice was the last straw. During my little drive to the grocery store, trying hard to stew in my anger while maintaining a reasonable speed limit, I saw it. A lemonade stand. Darn it, you've got to be kidding me! So a little backstory. Last summer, I established a new personal policy regarding lemonade stands. You see, I tend to overthink. My old pattern of behavior went, went, went like this. I'd see some kids running a lemonade stand, and I'd think about, it, uh, about stopping only to drive past while overthinking it to death. Have you ever done this? Did I have cash on me? Did I have the time? Was there even a convenient place to park? I've already driven six blocks past it. Would it be stupid to turn around and go back now? Ultimately, I'd miss the moment, and it would upset my day. Last year, I decided to take the thinking and the overthinking out of it. I decided to establish a new rule. Always stop at the lemonade stand. Of course, in order for this new personal policy to work, it had to be ironclad. I had to be all in. No excuses. I gave myself permission to be late to wherever it was I was going, even if it was late to my own father's funeral. I had to stop at the lemonade stand. And it was a powerful, it was a powerful setup. It's a lot easier to commit 100% all in than it is to just go part way, because when you go part way, you don't really commit. You'll always give yourself a reason why it's okay to ignore the rule this one time. So I liked this new policy. I liked that it allowed me to be more generous. And I've liked that it was in line with the type of person God is creating me to be. So since then, I've stopped at the lemonade stands. I've always asked the kids what they're raising money for, and I always try to encourage them in small ways, and I always overtip. Even though I foresaw days when I'd encountered lemonade stands when I was running late, I didn't consider days when I was really, really angry. But a rule is a rule. No exceptions, right? I'm all in. So I stopped at the lemonade stand. Back to today. These two girls, they looked like sisters. They were sitting on lawn chairs behind a folding table. They looked bored out of their minds until I pulled up and got out of the car. And then they grinned as wide as they could be. They were offering two options, regular lemonade and raspberry lemonade, which I told them was a good strategy. I ordered one each, 50 cents a glass. I asked them what they were saving up for, and they sheepishly sheepishly admitted, hopefully a pug, you know, one of those ugly dogs. No offense to pug owners. I gave them a $5 bill and told them to keep the change and wished them luck. Now, there are a bunch of lessons here, but I trust you'll find the the reminder that you need most right now. But as I turned my car with two plastic cups of lukewarm lemonade in my hand, I realized something. I was no longer angry. Isn't that incredible? This word of encouragement for us today that comes from one of our own is a reminder that when we go all in, it changes us. And it's so much more of how we get served when we go all in than how we necessarily served. It really makes an impact on our own lives. And so today, as as you've learned from this lesson, generosity can help change our hearts. And that's one more way we express being all in. So today I invite you to give your tithes and offerings as you have been called to give. 
out of a sense that God is good and he is doing good work in us and through us as a church. He's sharing encouraging words in us and through us. And so as you are called to give, again, you may give in the offering plate, you can give online, but remember, as we go all in, it's not as much the sacrifice, but it really is about what God is doing to change us and shape us, and maybe even help us deal with our anger a little bit. So that's, that's our God signing today. We've got another song. It's about worship. All of this is about worship, worshiping the King. So will you stand as we continue in our worship? Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Let us see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, Hero of Heaven. You conquered the grave, you freed every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know, and I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, here. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done Sing great hallelujah. things. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, oh God, you have done great things. Amen. Our gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 25. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You not, shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, there is still one saying lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at, them, at him and said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, will you say hi to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're here. Let's greet one another. We are so glad that everyone's able to join us for worship today, and I'm kind of excited about this scripture and this final lesson in our series as well. Believe it or not, I, I used to be really adventurous. Okay, adventurous is probably not the right word. Careless is probably more the right word, right? Like, like a lot of young men, I lived life as though I was invincible for a long time. There was times that I would jump off of buildings. There, there was a time I flipped a four-wheeler at full speed. There was a time I caught a Jeep on fire while I was driving it. And there was a time I fell out of a car <laughs> while it was moving. Yes, my mom's going to learn about some of those in the next service, so please pray for me. <laughs> so my wife, she always, she always says it's a miracle that any adult or any male makes it to adulthood, right? But scientists tell us that at about age 25, the male brain finally fully develops, which just means we have no more excuses for the stupid things we do. But I used to love the adrenaline rush. I used to love the adventure of it. And if it was dangerous, it seemed even more attractive to me. But somewhere along the way, I became less brave. I remember when I was still in youth ministry, there was a, a, a group of teens in our youth group that decided they wanted to go parachuting, and they asked me to go with them. I'm like, man, that sounds so cool. I love zip lining. I've gone parasailing before, and I'm like, this is something I need to do because I'm going to earn some awesome cool points with these teenagers. But when it came to the day to sign up, I chickened out. I just couldn't take that final leap, right? Pun intended, I guess. Believe it or not, that's what today's scripture is all about. Not parachuting, but that lack of commitment, that that failure to take that last step to go all in. See, today we wrap up our sermon series called All In, and and for the last five weeks we've been talking about what does it look like, what does it mean to be fully committed to Christ, to take the plunge for our faith. And today's story really is a unique ending to this series. Now, the scripture is often referred to as the rich young ruler. And a variation of this story appears in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark as well. In Luke, there's no mention of him being young. And in the other two Gospels, there's no mention of him being a ruler. And yet it's all three of the Gospel writers remembered this story and and included it. So there must be an incredible lesson in the text for us. The thing is, I've never ever heard the scripture preached on any time except for a stewardship campaign. Let's be honest, there were some of you when you heard the scripture today, you're like, oh great, the pastor's going to ask for money again, right? That's what we always think the scripture is about. But I'm here to tell you the lesson isn't about money. At least it's not just about money, right? See, for the young ruler in today's story, his wealth was his hang-up. For some of us, it might be as well. Author and pastor Mark Batterson writes, isn't it ironic that in God we trust is printed on the very thing we find it most difficult to trust God with? See, the real lesson isn't about what, what money does, but what comes between us and God. 
For some of us, it, it might be the love of money, but it's not the only barrier that separates us. In reality, just about anything can be a stumbling block on our faith journey. An attitude, a prejudice, jealousy, political positions, a hobby, and yes, even sometimes our theology can be a stumbling block. The thing is, God should never play second fiddle to anything or anyone. And it's easy for us to say it, but man, is it harder to live it. See, for some, this series, this all-in series, probably felt a little like the old cliche of preaching to the choir, right? Many of us have already made this commitment to Christ, and we think, we're already there, let's stop talking about it. Only I'm convinced that the vast majority of us that call ourselves Christians are willing to follow Jesus up until a certain point, up until the cost becomes too high. And that's really what today's scripture is all about. Methodist pastor Billy Strayhorn writes, it, this story, calls into question the things, attitudes, and practices in our lives that keep us from total commitment. It's about ending the separation and taking the last step. Only first we have to figure out what are those things that are really holding us back. And today's scripture actually helps us with that. In verse 18 it reads, A, a certain ruler came to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now it seems like a, a very legitimate question. There's no indication in this scripture or any of the other tellings that he's there to trick Jesus or to trap him or, or that he's disrespecting him in some way. He seems genuine, really wanting to grow and have insight. Now, we shouldn't follow Jesus just so we can get to heaven or so we avoid hell. I get that, but I've never seen today's text as being offensive. We're called to follow Jesus because he's Jesus. And yet I didn't look at the scripture and go, wow, this guy is really off base. And then this week I, I got caught up in a wording choice that I, I guess I'd never seen before. See, this man, he asks, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now, some things I know literally get lost in translation with the Bible, and maybe that's what happened here. See, this is one of those times that I wish I'd been brave enough to take a Greek class when I was in seminary, because I, I really just have to trust other people's interpretations of those things. And yet, I'm also aware that I have forgotten almost everything from my Spanish classes in high school, so it probably wouldn't have done me any good anyway. But the wording just, just caught me. What must I do to inherit? I mean, an inheritance is typically seen more as a gift, right? A gift from a parent or a family member or a loved one. It's not something we can earn necessarily, right? Right? But we all hear stories about someone who got cut out of the will, right? So maybe there's something to it. But when I look at this scripture, I, I've always seen it as this gift because of a relationship, right? That's what an inheritance is. And there's something amazing to me that our, our inheritance as a child of God is eternity in heaven, how amazing is that picture? But see, ultimately, the man in today's text, he asks, how can I earn a spot in heaven? What must I do? I don't know, maybe sometimes we ask that same question. I'm guessing we don't use those same words, and if we're honest, most of the times we don't even think about doing it. Only sometimes we, we view our faith, we view salvation 
as some sort of accomplishment. The thing is, we can't earn it. We can't be good enough. We can't do it on our own. And so as Christians, we rely on this incredible gift of grace, and then we spend our lives trying to say thank you. I've got to tell you, though, I was so intrigued by the way Jesus answered this question, right? Did you catch the different commandments he talks about? Not all ten, but five of them, right? Look at verse 20. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. It's a little variation on the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. I mean, isn't it crazy? Jesus never mentions in this list any of the commands about honoring God. Isn't it fascinating that his focus is fully on human relationships? It's another detail I think we we miss so easily. But why did Jesus pick these commands? Why were these the ones that are so important? See, I think Jesus was reminding us that we can't truly honor God if we're not loving other people. In verse 21, the man answers, he says, I have kept all of these since my youth. (laughs) I don't know about you, but it kind of makes me smile, right? The cynic in me goes, yeah, right. You've kept all of them since your youth? I doubt it. I mean, clearly this man was not there when Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount. Because in Matthew 5, as Jesus is preaching, he tells people that to have anger or hatred in your heart is the same as murder. He says to look at someone in lust is committing adultery in your heart. I've kept all of these since my youth. I don't know about that. If so, he was certainly a better man than I am. Jesus responds again. Only I have to take a little rabbit trail here for a moment, so please forgive me and, and take this journey with me. See, in my research this week, I didn't just look at today's scripture, but the parallel stories in the other gospels as well. And I came across something that kind of intrigued me. See, the gospel of Mark is often considered like the get her done type version, right? Mark is the shortest of the gospels. He doesn't have much fluff in there. It's always kind of a rush. When you read it, he says immediately over and over again, and you just feel like you run through the entire gospel story. But when it comes to this text, this story, Mark is actually the longest of the three tellings. This whole eye of the camel in the eye of a needle thing, it comes as part of a later conversation in Mark's remembering of it. But when it comes to this place, this part in the story where Jesus responds, Mark adds one thing that amazed me. Mark 10, 21. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. Did you catch what Mark added? See, in Matthew's telling, in today's text, Jesus responds, but only in Mark does it say he loved him and responded. I find myself going, what what is it that Mark saw the others didn't? What is it about this interaction? What is it that he saw on Jesus' face that made him pause and say, no, he loved him first? I wish I knew. But the meaning of the scripture, the challenge is, it's the same. We have to love before we respond. Okay, back to today's text, right? Right? Jesus responds and says, there is still one thing lacking. And I can't help but think, one? That's pretty good. (laughs) 
I can't speak for any of you, but when I look at the shortcomings in my spiritual life, I'd be pretty happy with one. I'd be pretty happy with 12. I'd be pretty happy with 20. Maybe I don't want to talk about it anymore, right? We all have shortcomings, but Jesus says, you have one thing you're lacking. That should be easy, right? But it's not. Jesus asks for the one thing this man can't let go of. His wealth, his possessions. Mark Batterson writes in one of his books, he says, I haven't met many people possessed by a demon, but I've met a lot of people possessed by their possessions. Ouch. Maybe that's never something you you felt concerned with. See, most of us don't consider ourselves to be materialistic. But then again, we live in the wealthiest nation in the world. Some would suggest we live in the wealthiest nation that has ever existed. It all depends on what we compare ourselves to. I gotta be honest with you though, I've I've struggled with this one. <laughs> I still struggle with this one sometimes. No, I don't get jealous because of what other people have, but I do like nice things. I drive a nicer car than I need to. I enjoy going out to a fancy restaurant. And when I travel, I don't stay in the cheapest hotel I can find. <laughs> but the one possession, the one, the one hang-up that was maybe my biggest and maybe the biggest for my family as well was our house in Kearney. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. It was a nice home, but it was nothing elaborate. What made it so special, what made it so meaningful is it was ours. <laughs> We built that home just the way we wanted in what we thought was the perfect location. We were just three doors down from Wendy's parents, so we had built-in babysitters anytime we needed. It was less than five minutes to Walmart, and yet we were out in the country. (laughs) We had this huge lot with this big garden, and when you looked out our back window for a half mile, all you saw was cornfield. It was awesome. If you got up early enough in the morning, you'd catch the deer eating apples off our tree in the front lawn. I thought it was perfect. I loved that house. I loved it too much. Batterson writes, the more God blesses you, the harder it is to keep that blessing from becoming an idol in your life. I felt that. We <laughs> felt that. Wendy will tell you she, she used to pray all the time, God, don't let our house become an idol that keeps us from following you. And so in God's irony, he calls me to be a United Methodist pastor. <laughs> See, for as long as I'm a minister, I will live where the best bishop tells me to live. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, we, we all shed some tears when we moved out of that house. I felt like the man in this story. Mike, sell your dream house and follow me. Maybe you can relate, maybe you can't. But the thing is, it's not about possessions. It's not about money or things. It's about what we start to value more than Jesus. Let me ask it this way. Are there things you put before God? What are the things, the the relationships, the beliefs that you value most? Would you give it up for Jesus? See, the scripture, it's not just about money. 
going all in, following Jesus at all costs, it's certainly not simple. In one of the commentaries I read this week, they they asked the question, does Jesus have the right to tell us what to do with our possessions? The thing is, if we see him as our possessions, we get possessive. (laughs) But when we start to see that everything we have, that everything we are, it all belongs to Christ, it starts to change our perspective. When we start living an all-in life step by step, we are changed. And if you're worried right now and saying, I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite there yet, Pastor Mike, that's okay, you're not alone. <laughs> but we should pursue it. We should chase after this goal of living an all-in life because Jesus deserves it. <laughs> because he is the Messiah. And when we start to live all in, see, that's when our lives, that's that's when our church, when our world starts to look more like the heaven we long for. Church, step by step, we're called to live all in. And if we can do that, What amazing things God has in store for us. Amen? Would you pray with me today? Loving and gracious God, we are so thankful that you have given us so much. We are so thankful that you have called us to be part of this incredible family that you have promised us a place in heaven. And Lord, sometimes we we get it wrong and we start to think we somehow have to earn your love and forgiveness. And you remind us we, we will always fall short. God, help us to keep pursuing you. Help us to start living step by step into this all in lifestyle. Not because it somehow earns us your favor, but because you, God, you deserve every piece of us. Everything that we are, everything that we have, God, it's because of you. God, help us to remember just how loved we are. Lord, as we come to this opportunity, this meal called communion, help us to remember your sacrifice was for us. Not because we were perfect, not because we will be, but because you are perfect, God. Lord, help us to remember it, to honor it, to embrace it, and to chase after this amazing life you have called us to. God, we ask you to to pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we can be Christ for the world, redeemed by your great love. By your spirit, God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until you come again in that final victory, until we can all feast at your heavenly banquet. We ask all of this, God, through the name of your Son, Jesus, who with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, we give all honor and glory to you, almighty God. Now, and forever. Amen. Well, church, we are here today because of what Christ has done. 
Not because we can earn it, not because we have a way of, of giving everything, but because Christ loved us. And so we're called to come to this meal remembering the sacrifice that was made. How the night when Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread and, and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. We come here because after the meal, Jesus took a cup and, and lifted it up to heaven, gave thanks to God for all who came before, for all who came after, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we come, step by step, to start living an all-in life for the God that gave his all for us. Well, as we continue today, we have this opportunity, as Pastor Mike stated, to participate in communion and a brief word of instruction. For those of you online, as always, you're welcome to continue with us in prayer and and focus in that way. For those of us here, I invite you to continue in this spirit of prayer and worship. And then when the time comes, make your way around either side of the sanctuary. Take a piece of bread or the gluten-free option and dip it lightly in the cup, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you. Take advantage of the kneelers and then eventually make your way back to your, uh, to your spot to continue in our worship, to continue in our prayer time. And most importantly, you don't have to be a member of this church or any church in order to participate. We just ask that you have that desire in your heart. We're going to sing a song called, He Won't. God won't fail us no matter what. So as our commitment to all in and this series kind of comes to an end, I just pray that you'll focus on his love and the fact that he has already gone all in for you. That's what this time is about, how he has already declared that love for you. Now we just get to receive it. Let us continue. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't No, he won't He won't Put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. 
is faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. He won't fail. See, we worship a God who went all in for us. And now it's our chance to respond. Go from this place. Go into the world. And in the little steps we take, let's start living a life where we are all in for Christ. Because he, he is meant to be our all in all. Thanks for worshiping today. <laughs> 